Um, tonight we're going to be focusing on verses 12 to 17 of that passage, but it's going to be, we're going to be looking at a few of the bits that, um, at the start as well. Um, before we start, I'm going to pray for us. Father God, as we come to study your word together tonight, please help us to set our minds on things above. Help us to focus on your son, Jesus, and please be changing us, renewing us, and clothing us, we pray, in his name. Amen. Amen. I'm sure at some point or another um, in your lives, you've been asked the question, who are you? It may have been that awkward icebreaker session where the person leading the meeting says, does everyone around the table know each other? Knowing full well that they're about to suggest that you may describe yourself to everyone else in a sentence. How do you describe your identity? We may describe our identity in terms of what we do for a living, where we grew up, where we were born, where we live, whether we're a son, a daughter, a mother, or a father. In tonight's passage, we're going to find out who we really are and what our true identity is. And more importantly, we're going to find out how we live in response to our true identity. We're going to start in verse 12, where the writer is addressing God's chosen people. But who are God's chosen people? The verse starts with a therefore, which is our clue to look at what has just been said. If we look back to verse 1 of the chapter, we see that we are talking about people who have been raised with Christ, who have set their hearts on things above. These people, their lives are hidden with Christ in God. God's people have, verse 4, accepted that, that, that Christ is their life and as a result will appear with him in glory. And if we jump forward into verse 11, we are reminded that Christ is in all and that he is all. There's no differentiating between Christians on race on the type of upbringing you've had. If we believe in that Jesus Christ rose and died, sorry, died and rose again for the forgiveness of sins, then we are God's chosen people. Our identity is found in Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that is pretty amazing. How do you, how can you respond to such love? Our passage this evening in Colossians is going to help us answer this. Firstly, we are to put on God's uh, to put on love because we are God's chosen people united in Christ. As God's chosen people, we are holy and dearly loved. We are a holy people. We are set apart for a specific purpose. And if we skip forward into ver the second half of verse 14, we see that God's specific purpose for us is to be united in perfect unity. And verses 12 to 14 unpack what this is to look like. We are to be clothed, clothed with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And over all these virtues, verse 14, we are to put on love which binds them together in perfect unity. Because we are God's chosen people. By putting on love and clothing ourselves with the virtues that lead to perfect unity in Christ, we are demonstrating that we are chosen in Christ. Our personal identity becomes our united identity as we start to live lives that look different. As we start to live as God intends us to live. If you can imagine a footballer who goes from a League One side and joins a premiership team, 
He takes off his old kit and he puts on the new team's colours. He starts playing football in the style his new manager wants him to play. And it's a bit like this with our clothing of ourselves. It's not to benefit ourselves, but it's to benefit our brothers and sisters in Christ. Like the footballer adapts his style of play to suit the manager, this then benefits the whole team, because they play as a team in a certain style in order to win. We are to be united as Christians here at Christ Church Westbourne. And if verse 12 is our personal clothing, then verse 13 is the expression of what our unity is to look like. As we bear with each other, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and we forgive whatever disagreements that we may have with each other. You see, we have a specific purpose to live as God's chosen people. Our putting on of compassion, kindness, humility, and all the other virtues are great things to put on. And they work best when they are clothed with love. If you can think of a jumper, it's made of many, diff uh, many lengths of wool, but on their own, those lengths of wool, they can't keep you warm. They don't function as a practical garment. It's only when those lengths of wool are knitted together that a jump is formed and the wool becomes something useful. It's able to fulfill its purpose of keeping the wearer warm. Likewise, these virtues only hang together when they're knitted together, when they're bound up by God's love. God's love for us and his giving of Jesus is our motivation to be forgiving people united in Christ. And we're to practice living this way as we bear with each other and forgive each other when we disagree. When we don't see eye to eye on a particular church issue or when we prefer a church gathering to be held in a certain way. There's the potential for us to get annoyed, isn't there? We might say, I don't agree with that, or that's not the way I'd have done it. We are told to bear with each other. Remember, Christ is all and in all. It is Christ that unites us. So as a church, we are told to focus on what we have together in Christ and follow his example. So this might mean that as individuals, we have to compromise on our personal preferences for singing on, or how, how gatherings are held as the footballer compromises his style of play. But as individuals, um, it's worth checking ourselves when we feel it's difficult to bear with our fellow Christians. Maybe you're asking yourself a question like, is what I'm arguing for or the, in the best interests of my fellow brothers and sisters, or will it just benefit me? Or asking, would Christ act like this? What is your attitude to our fellow Christians when we disagree? Do you hold a grudge? Do you not talk to them for a few weeks? I hope not. But whatever, we are to forgive whatever grievances we have. There's no hiding from the fact that forgiving each other, it may be costly to us, it may dent our pride, our status, it may affect us emotionally or financially. But forgive is what we must do if we are to live together in perfect unity. This is what is pleasing to God. And do not think it's all too difficult to forgive this time because of whatever it might be. Look to Jesus for an example. Our passage says that we are to forgive as the Lord forgave us in verse 13. You see, Jesus paid the ultimate price when he died on the cross to forgive our sins. And even when he was nailed to the cross, he forgave the people that put him there, as it's recorded in Luke's Gospel. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. 
Christ's love displayed to us as he forgave his killers, as he died on the cross, should motivate us to forgive each other. So we find our united identity in Christ. We are God's chosen people. He loves us. We are to put on love. We are to unite in Christ as together we become more like Christ um, in our behaviour towards each other. Now you may think that's an impossible task. I mean, look at us. But the impossible is made possible through Jesus. And fortunately, what comes next in our passage are some practical tools on how to live according to God's specific purpose. Verse 15 gives us a picture of what, God's, what it looks like to be God's chosen people. We are called, as members of one body, to peace. We are one body with Christ as the head. And the point being illustrated reinforces what we've already seen, that we share one identity. We are one body with a specific purpose. Considering this letter um, to the Colossians was, was written to a specific church, it may be helpful for us to think of ourselves here as, as Christ's body in the local church. So we may be able to read verse 15 as members of Christ's body at Christ Church Westbourne, we are called to peace. But what is the peace of Christ? Peace is not the feeling when all the chores are done or the children are in bed and we can sit down with a cup of tea and put our feet up and relax. No. As one commentator writes, the peace of Christ is the contentment in the hearts of believers who know firstly that Christ lives and that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. The peace of Christ is knowing that the present is being overruled for God's good. Our lives are hidden with Christ. We are being renewed in the knowledge of God. And if you are here this evening to investigate who Jesus is, please know that the peace of Christ is a gift from God. It's freely available to all those who realise that they're sinners before him who ask for, to God for forgiveness, trusting that Jesus died and that he has been raised from the dead to make you right with God. True peace means that God no longer calls us his enemies, but he calls us his friends. You see, true peace is a relationship. It's not a feeling. We are called to peace as members of one body. And if you think about your human body, it has a common mission, doesn't it, to, to keep itself alive. All the parts have, of the body have a specific function, and they work together to achieve it. It might be our hearts pumping the blood around, but without um, the stomach and, and the intestines, there would be nothing useful in the blood to pump around. And without hands to put food in our mouths, our stomachs would be empty. All the parts of the body have to work together. They have to be at peace in order to sustain life. Likewise, we have been called to work together to sustain our God-given mission to serve him as a team. Now this will display itself as we live in Christ's peace together, as we relate to our brothers and sisters here at Christ Church Westbourne. Christ's peace is to call the tune, is to determine our relationships with each other as we work together to, make, to know Christ ourselves and to make Christ known amongst us. It is the body amongst where Christ-like behaviour is to be practised, to be expressed and to be experienced together. And like our hands take direction from our, our brains, our heads so we as Christians take direction from our head our king Jesus whose peace we should let rule in our hearts to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts we must give authority over to him 
we are to hand control over to him. So our letting of Christ's peace rule in our hearts is a, di- is a direct, obedient and conscious decision, response to Christ's love that he poured out for us. Do we let Christ rule in our hearts or just portions of it? We may like to keep control of sex- parts of our hearts for ourselves, for our self-indulgence. We like to take ourselves off for some me time. We set time apart to live our lives in the way that we want, doing the things we want, the hobbies we like doing. But the Bible says we have been made holy. We've been set apart for God, not for ourselves. And we are to let Christ rule in everything. So how can you, could you use your free time, your hobbies differently? Could um, your hobbies be a chance to to pray for others or an opportunity to invite others to join you? We are called to peace, to put on love, to practice living a Christ-like way, which means we should make an effort to meet up with other Christians, to build up relationships, to understand each other's difficulties and struggles, and to help each other in our faith to help us love each other better. And this will certainly mean letting the peace of Christ rule in every thought and deed, even the hidden motivations of our hearts. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're not very good at this. The peace of Christ does not rule our every thought. So it's important that we keep reminding ourselves of who Jesus is and our identity in him. Like our bodies need food to stop us from fainting, we too, as Christians, need food. And we are to rely on our brothers and sisters in Christ as we feed each other with the word of God. Look down at verse 16. It's the second practical tool that we see is that putting on, for putting on love, we are to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. You see, it's by allowing the the word of God to dwell richly in us that peace rules. And it's a combination of peace ruling and word dwelling that we are able to put on love. And we each have a role to play in helping our brothers and sisters. But notice, before we can teach and admonish, We need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. It's from the word of Christ dwelling in us and singing gospel truths that wisdom comes. We are to be rooted in the gospel, rooted in the truths of God. We are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly, not just a little bit on a Sunday evening, but we are to dwell in his word regularly. This means setting time apart aside to read the Bible and to pray. Do you prioritise reading the Bible at home over watching TV? Do you schedule in your leisure activities around home group and prayer meetings and meeting up with your fellow Christians? Or is it the other way around? These are challenging questions and they need to be addressed if we're serious about living as one body. Again, we cannot teach and admonish effectively without knowing each other. We rarely listen or take on advice of someone we hardly know, let alone on such personal issues as our sin. We need to be putting on love for the sake of our brothers and sisters. We need to make the effort to have that conversation to have people round for a meal or a cup of tea, to be building up Christ-like relationships, because teaching and admonishing one another is a corporate act. Dwelling in the word of Christ provides the foundation we need to support our brothers and sisters. We are here to support each other as we grow to know and love the Lord Jesus more. To go back to the example of the human body, 
Even the smallest parts have a part to play in this. Our white blood cells, for example, you might not be able to see them and they're, they're microscopic, but they are helping us and they're protecting us from germs and disease. Even the youngest Christian has a role to play in supporting the church. We all have a role to play. We're all reliant on each other. And this is how God planned it to be. It's the right way of living. As Christians, we are to live as God intended us to. You see, God chose us as his people to be members of one body called to perfect unity. So we are called to put on Christ's love. But to put on love requires us to teach and admonish one another, which in turn requires wisdom. And wisdom requires putting on love. And putting on love allows, comes from the peace dwelling in us, sorry, the, the word of Christ dwelling in us, and Christ's peace ruling in us. You see, there's a bit of a, a cycle there, isn't there? But it all starts and ends with our relationship with God. We are responsible for teaching and explaining the Bible to each other, praying for each other, warning each other of potential stumbling blocks that may be stopping us from knowing God more fully. As we live in this way, we're called to be thankful. And that brings us on to our final point for this evening. Be thankful. Now, as a child, I, I used to like playing catch, and if I'm honest, I still do. Um, and can you imagine a group of friends playing catch with a cricket ball in the park? It's a nice day, and you and a friend are taking a walk in that very same park. As you're talking, one of the guys who's playing catch accidentally throws a stray ball, and this cricket ball is heading straight for your head. You haven't seen it coming, you haven't noticed it at all. But fortunately for you, your friend has. Now your friend is a good friend, and they don't want to see you get hurt, so they warn you, and they push you to one side, and the cricket ball flies past your head. It misses you. Now how do you respond to that friend? You thank them, I hope. Likewise, when our friends warn us about a particular habit that we've adopted that is not Christ-like, we should thank them. We should be thankful for our brothers and sisters in Christ that we are able to teach and admonish each other because they have spotted an issue and can help us work through it to become more like Christ. Do we thank God for the teaching and admonishing we receive from our brothers and sisters? Putting on love and living as God's chosen people is not a part-time job. Our identity in Christ is not something we can get out for Chris when it's Christmas or when the going's good. As God's chosen and holy people, we are dearly loved and we are to set our minds on things above. We're ruled by a heavenly standard. But stumbling blocks and metaphorical cricket balls are coming at us from all directions. The world is constantly telling us that we're in charge of our lives, that we're to do what makes us happy. Whereas the Bible tells us to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The world says work hard, look after yourself, earn lots of cash, live for the moment. The Bible tells us to dwell in the word of Christ, look after others, help each other become more like Christ, because our life is in heaven with Christ. How often do you thank God for the members of Christ Church Westbourne and your other Christian friends? Not only for helping, not only for the help that people give you on specific issues, but just the fact that we're all together living for Christ becoming more like Christ. Many of you, I'm sure, have been round to other people's houses for lunch today as part of Hospitality Sunday. No doubt you've met someone you didn't know so well or have been encouraged by a word spoken. Isn't it great that we can meet together knowing that we are at peace 
through, with God through Jesus. We are to be thankful for the practical tools that Jesus gives us as we help each other in verses 15 and 16. And we should also be thankful for the freedom that we enjoy in Christ in verse 17. Verse 17 tells us, or says, Do and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. By grace, God gives us freedom in Christ. We have put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, and we have put on our new selves. Whatever we do now is to be done in our new clothing. And it's freedom we enjoy because Christ died to rescue us. So be thankful. We started this evening asking ourselves, who are you? How do you describe your identity? The Bible tells us that if we've accepted God's gift of grace and believe that, if, that Jesus died and that he is Lord, then our identity is found in him. Having been chosen and set apart by God, he intends us to live a certain way. We are called to peace with each other as members of one body. This is God's specific purpose for us, to live in response to his love. A response we can only achieve by letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts and as we dwell together as, as, and by dwelling richly in God's word together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that we are a chosen people, set apart for you and by you. Thank you that, you that we are dearly loved and set apart for your purposes. In response, Father God, help us to put on love, to put on clothing that you would have us wear as we become a united people, a people at peace who dwell in your word richly. Please help us as we go about knowing Christ and making Christ known for your glory. Amen.